Hi Ecology Lab. This is the first in a series of videos that I'll post to help explain some of the concepts that we're covering in our weekly lab assignments. I'll also post some videos where we can um, discuss the, the semester project where we'll do some simulation modeling um, and some practical videos on how to run R uh, to do your analyses and, and make your figures. So in this video, I'd just, just kind of like to talk about some conceptual things that we'll be working with in this first week's lab, and we'll see kind of throughout the semester. So we talked about, you know, what the course is, right? This is a course in quantitative ecology. And uh, ecology, of course, is the study of interactions between organisms and interactions between organisms and their environment. And ecologists use quantitative methods basically to make sure you know, to see patterns and, and understand relationships, uh, interactions. Um, but also we use, we use statistics to make sure we're not seeing patterns where there, there aren't patterns, right? We're not fooling ourselves because humans often see patterns where none really exist. Um, and we also want to make sure that we detect patterns that are there that, that we might not see. So ecologists use sort of three really broad categories of approaches. Um, you know, we collect data, we usually analyze those data with some kind of statistics, again, to make sure we're not fooling ourselves. Um, but we can do, you know, sort of three broad ways of investigating things. And, and the first is, you know, observation of patterns. Um, and so when we do observational studies, we might go out into the field. And so, for instance, maybe we have some idea of elevation influencing um, some interactions between species or some, some um or, or, or some, some facet of, of species, uh, you know, metabolism or whatever. Um, and so we might go and we might, you know, collect data along an elevational transect and then analyze those data and see if there are patterns. Um, the problem with this is there are, of course, many confounding variables. Not only does elevation change, but temperature and moisture might change, soil types might change, uh, the presence and absence of of some other kind of organisms might change, and it might change over time as well. So although this is a great first step in, in a lot of under, ecological understanding, um, where it falls short is that we have, um, it's really difficult to assign causality. So one way to address that is with manipulative experiments. So if we manipulate things, you know, we can carefully control what factors change so for instance, if you have an alpine meadow here, um, you can change things. You can change the uh, length of the amount of light by add, sub, adding supplemental light. You can change the soil nutrition uh, by adding um, soil nutrients. You can exclude or you can exclude rainfall and precipitation to simulate drought, or you can add extra uh, irrigation to simulate wet periods. You can experimentally heat uh, things, right? So if you, if you manipulate those things carefully in a well-designed experiment, it helps you to assign causality. Um, one of the shortcomings, of course, is manipulative experiments are, by definition, artificial. And so, again, we, we might um, have some limitations there based on a manipulative experiment might not play out the same way in, a, in, in the wild, right, in an uncontrolled setting. So, uh, again, these two methods sort of complement each other, both observational studies and manipulative experiments. And then a third approach is model building. So with model building, what you're doing is you're saying, we have a hypothesis or we have some idea about how a system works, and we try to model the most essential components in that system. Again, there are lots of interacting factors and, and ecological systems are very complex. But if we can model um, the key elements that we think are important, uh, and then we, we run that model, and if we get the same patterns that we observe in the real world, then we know our model has good explanatory power that we can really explain these relationships uh, and, and at least see the key factors that influence them. And these models can take the, the form of you know, mathematical models and they can be process based where we have a series of equations that describes some behavior in an ecosystem. Um, they can be statistical models that look at, at probabilities uh, based on, again, based on observation or even manipulative experiments. Or they can be simulation models where we program uh, behavior into an ecosystem based on, again, on those mathematical models. And then we can run it many times in a simulation and, and see what happens. Um, so we're going to be, you know, delving into all these approaches over the course of the semester. And your semester project is going to be building 
a simulation model. Now let's talk a little bit about statistics. So again, we do statistics to make sure that we're actually seeing patterns that exist and we're not, we're not fooling ourselves. Um, and so if you can think about, we, we often have or usually have a, a, an independent and dependent variable. Right? So an independent variable would be something that we, we suppose causes change in the dependent variable. Right? So as the independent variable changes, we'd expect a response in the dependent variable. And these variables can either be continuous, right? So you can think of continuous measurements like temperature or height or mass or something like that. Or they can be categorical, right? High, medium, low, uh, male, female, um, any, any kind of categories that you can, you can apply. And so the type of statistical test to do to, to see if there's a real difference, to see if there's a pattern, uh, depends on whether you have continuous or uh, categorical variables. So if you have continuous, uh, a continuous independent variable and a continuous dependent vari variable, you'd use correlation or regression, right? <clears throat> You're measuring the change. Uh, as one variable changes continuously, what's the response in the dependent variable? If you have categorical data, all right, so if, let's we say we have high elevation and low elevation sites, and we have some continuous response like biomass or species uh, richness or something like that. Um, that's where we'd use a t-test or an ANOVA to see if there's significant differences between our categories of independent variables. And then um, it's really rare it's really rare that you'd have anything down here, so we don't really have a test for that. Um, but if you have two categorical variables, uh, that's where you do a chi-square test. And we'll do a lab later in the semester where we do chi-square. Okay, so let's say we did an experiment here, or we did an observational study, and we had an idea that um, butterfly species richness, right, or, or diversity of butterfly species would be um, related to the distance from forest edge. So let's say, a, you know, forest edge we might think is a very uh, good habitat for butterflies. So we go out there and we set up plots in, um, uh, at, at different distances from the edge of the forest, and we take a sample of, of butterflies at each one and we, we count the number of species, right? So we can see here um, our independent variable, the thing that we think is driving the relationship, distance from edge, is on the x-axis, and that's customary. And the response variable, or the dependent variable, um, is on the y-axis. So we think that distance from forest edge is driving butterfly species. So we go out there and each of these circles, each of these orange circles represents a plot. Um, and we see you know, a pretty clear relationship, right? So as we uh, have greater distance from forest edge, we have fewer species, right? So we might say, uh, and then we can run some statistics on that. We can run a correlation or a, you know, a regression model and we could say, oh, it's a significant relationship, right? Let's say we get a p-value less than 0.05, right? So you typically you do a, a correlation and a p-value. And if it's less than 0.05, you'd say, well, there's a statistically significant difference. Uh, or a st statistically uh, significant relationship, right? Or if it's less than 0.01, you might say it's highly significant. Right? But you're probably familiar with this um, this phrase: correlation is not causation. And um, you know we've all probably heard that and maybe even used that in, in conversational uh, language. But really, have we ever really thought about it? Uh, and one of the reasons correlation is not causation is because there's many possible outcomes that might describe this relationship. So um, possible explanations for this pattern or any pattern where you have a significant correlation um, is, is not just causation. Okay, so number one, you could be right, right? X could cause Y. The dependent variable could be the main or the sole cause of variability in Y, right? So you could be right, could be causation. Or you could have this situation where y causes x. Um, that's maybe not not likely in this situation, right? I don't see how butterflies, butterfly diversity could could drive forest edge, right? Or, um, but there are many situations, especially in, in complex ecological systems, where you could have causation totally backwards, right? And y could be causing x. Another possible one, and this is an important one is that the relationship between x and y could be caused by z, 
right? It could be caused by some third variable or a combination of many other variables that you didn't measure, right? And so this is what's really, really important when you design any kind of scientific study. You have to really think hard about what are the important variables and are there any missing? Because if you're missing something key, you're going to misinterpret the results. So X and Y maybe are caused by variability in some third variable that you didn't measure. So that's, again, why we can't say correlation is causation. Um, number four, you could have something really complicated going on, right? You could have X causing Y, <coughs> causing y and Y causing X. You could have feedbacks between the two. Or you could have something like... Um, you know, the relationship between X and Y changes as some other variable changes, right? So um, then you need to worry about, you know, interactions and, and things like that, which we'll cover in a, in a later lab. Uh, or five, uh, it could really just be a spurious correlation. It could be no relationship. You could have a p-value of 0.01, and maybe you were just unlucky, and your sample uh, falls in that 1% uh, of, uh, of, of, um, of samples that, that doesn't that that where where there really isn't a relationship so, so it could be could be spurious if you if you have a big enough sample size you can usually deal with that um but again um there's many possible outcomes which is why we can't infer causation from correlation so let's talk specifically about this week's lab so one of the things you did is you you measured the length of pine needles or or conifer needles uh, from some species of tree around campus and so you took a sample and you have variability in those measurements, right? Every needle that you measured um, had a different length and you put them all together and you can create a histogram like this. So this is a histogram of, of birth weight, right? So the babies born, the number of babies born in these different weight categories by kilogram. And we have this distribution, right? And this is a nice normal bell-shaped distribution with the highest values uh, or the mo most frequent values near the mean. and uh, more extreme values uh, farther away from the mean. Um, but you get something like this for, for pine needles or, or whatever. And um, when we do this, when we take a sample, what we really want to know is we want to make some inferences about the larger population, right? So here's a sample of, of birth weight of babies. And we want basic, probably what we want to know is, is this representative of, you know, the total population of babies born in a certain country or worldwide or, or whatever. The same thing with pine needles. You took a sample of 80 needles that you measured, um, but you are hoping that that's representative of all of the pine needles on all of the uh, trees of that species on campus, right? That's the population you're trying to make inferences about. So a lot of sampling is really, what we wanna consider is, does our sample mean match the true population mean? Right? If you were to take every needle off of every tree of that species on campus and measure them, there would be a mean, right? There'd be a true mean. So we wanna know, does our sample represent that mean? And we can use some statistics to help us out with that. Okay, so the first thing uh, we can use to help us is the, the sort of characteristics of a distribution. So if your data are normally distributed like this, with this bell-shaped curve, um, we can calculate what's called the standard deviation. This is the sample standard deviation right here. And basically what it, what it is, it's roughly the sort of average distance between any, any data point, any measurement, and the sample mean, right? And that's the way you calculate it, right? You take the, each value uh, minus the mean, uh, you square those and you divide by the sample, uh, divide by the sample size, minus one, you take the square root of the whole thing, and that's your standard deviation. Uh, which is often uh, abbreviated with a sigma here. Um, but what that means is um, you can expect, if your data are normally distributed, uh, you know, about two thirds of them are going to fall within one standard deviation of the mean, above or below that mean. Um, and about 95%, you know, if we add together all these, 95% um, of those values are going to fall within two standard deviations. So basically, this is useful for describing, you know, the spread of the data, and it's also useful for figuring out if you have a data point, is it an unusually high or low data point, or is it normal, right? Um, and this is useful for, for a lot of things, right? Uh, you know, you can imagine in, 
um, if you have some kind of blood test and you want to know if some of the levels of some compound in somebody's blood is normal, you'd take a measurement of that and you'd compare it to a distribution. But the other thing we might want to do, and this is much more common, is are our data, um, if we have two groups of data, is there a difference between them, right? Um, and so, you know, you might have a treatment and a control and you want to know, are they really different or not? And in that case, you can use a different kind of statistic. So standard deviation is a descriptive statistic. Um, but what we want to use in that case is an inferential statistic. Are the, is, we want to infer, is that difference real? Is there really a pattern there? And one of the more common ones is called standard error. So this is the equation for standard error. You just take the standard deviation, which you calculate over here, and you divide it by the square root of the, of the sample size. Okay, then we communicate um, our statistics using error bars in a graph. So over here on the left, we've got um, a descriptive statistic, right? The range of values or the standard deviation. So each of the gray bars over here is the mean. Here you can see the data points for reference. And you know, so we have a sample size of three, of 10, and of 30. So the top of the gray bar is the mean, and then the error bars, the little whiskers here, um, show the, the range and the standard deviation. So the more spread out your values are, um, you know, the 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 wider your range, potentially the wider your standard deviation is. Notice that the standard deviation doesn't vary with sample size because it's based on the spread of the data, the, the shape of the distribution. Now over here on the right, again, this is much more common in ecology. What we want to know is there a difference, there a difference between treatment and control. And so we might use something like standard error or confidence interval. So this is a graph of standard error. And so we see, uh, you know, two different uh, environments, the black and the gray bars. And this is, you know, percent leaves infected with a, with a fungus. And we want to see, is there a difference between those, between those two groups? Um, so we might want to see, is there a difference between the black bars and the gray bars? Or do we want to see, is there a difference between the black bars of different uh, groups, right? Connected, winged, and rectangle. Um, and there we're going to use the standard error. And basically what the standard error is telling us is how different is, um, how likely are we to have the true population mean within the range of standard errors, right? So how close is our sample mean likely to be compared to the true population mean, right? How good is our, is our model? So that's a very different thing and it's, it's really important. Standard deviation won't really tell you much about are these groups uh, different or similar but standard error will. And potentially even better than standard error is confidence intervals. So what a confidence interval tells you is if we were to repeat that uh, sample many times, 90, so these are 95% confidence intervals, that's saying 95% of the time, um, the, the true population mean will be contained within uh, those those confidence intervals. And so this is important in that, you know, basically you can see here, um, we've got the population mean here. And if your error bars, your confidence limits uh, cross that, uh, cross the population mean, um, then it's, it's, you know, not different from the population mean. But if your error bars don't cross that population mean, it shows that you've got something that's significantly different or, or an unusual outlier. So be careful with descriptive and inferential error bars. Know which ones you'd want to use in different situations. Um, and we'll be talking about that again and again uh, throughout the semester.